which is gallant, but I, but obviously due to my sexual orientation, I had obviously changed it now to Japanese. I come from Durban. I'm Indian. My mother died when I was six, and from the age of seven until I was 13 years, my father used to rape me, and literally all all six, and at that time I was too young to even complain to anyone, because I had a brother who was eight months old, and eventually the day when I was obviously 13 years of age, I pushed my father. The reason why I didn't want to say to the teachers or anything, because he was a breadwinner of my family, so he was like literally supporting us. So if I was going to complain to anyone, then they would take him away, so that means there'd be no goodies for me, or there'll be no food for my family. And eventually, I was going out with this guy in Durban, so I was actually very straight acting. So I was, as people would say, in the closets. Um, so this guy actually wanted me to kill my father. And I actually <laughs> had the gun <laughs> and my father was drunk. So I went upstairs into the room. So my father was sitting on his chest drawer. And he was obviously facing towards the wardrobe. And I opened the door. And I already had the gun and the gloves with me to shoot him. And then when, as I just want to pull the trigger, and then I just see my mother's vision. So I just somehow stop and I put the gun down and I just walked out. So this guy that wanted me uh, actually mastermind this whole uh, of me killing my father. So he told me he will make sure <laughs> my family will make me suffer. But he ended up taking our pictures and putting it on my father's Facebook timeline. Literally there was like three or four pictures of us kissing so when my brother came home from work, he just called me and said, can I speak to you? I said, yes, what's it? So my father eventually told me, no, you must leave. Just went to the Intercape uh, bus station and I booked myself a ticket. So I asked him what time is the next bus to get down. So when I first came here, I was at the Napier Street shelter. Uh, but I actually didn't stay there physically. So when I went there, they asked me to go to the private shelter. Private shelter is a, it's a safe place for people that's in crisis, life's in crisis. Um, being abusively a, a relationship, um, being raped, um, just tanked out with sexuality. And we try and help them to get them back on their feet again. I stayed there for those two months or three months and then I was asked to be because you have to actually have a job so you actually have to look for a job every day so which I was doing I was filling the forms out wherever I went to ask for employment but I didn't know on the 5th or 6th of August my time was up Pride Child has uh, helped a lot of people a lot of people and unfortunately um, we don't get a lot of funding from the public we get a lot of donations, but uh, to run a shelter like this costs quite a bit of money. So I ended up coming onto the street, so I ended up doing business. So I ended up doing prostitution. So there was these two guys that I actually, um, they actually wanted direction. So the guy asked me to show him where's the toilet, the public toilet. But their intention was to rob me because they could see I was not from Victor. They knew I was from Durban, but they didn't know I was staying on the street at that time. And as I showed them the toilet. Now we have two holes here, and the one is standing here, and the other one is outside to watch the people. And the one with the knife is so going to be here. So we have to talk about clothes. So I drop my hands down, one is busy here, and with this time he went outside and then the other one came. And then by then, when I looked, it was just full of blood all over here. So he still threw tissue 
over here for the second one. So I just end up walking myself and then I walked out. As I walked out, I thought, is anyone looking at me in my front blood? So I then walked straight to the um, triangle project. I'm Carol Lennon. I'm the clinic and outreach nurse for Triangle Project. We're a non-profit organization, a human rights organization that focuses on the LGBTQI plus community. Um, we provide uh, services to any um, person who needs help that identifies as LGBTQI. Um, the programs that we run are health services, advocacy services and community empowerment and engagement services. The organization itself um, has, it's, one, it's the oldest organization in South Africa um, and it's been running for over 20 years. Daphne came in uh, very emotional um, and came into the clinic. There were various things that Daphne was struggling with. Um, one, uh, that she had never um, had penetrative sex um, before. Um, so that was, that was very hard for her, that her first experience of it was rape. So once we had, uh, I stabilized her, then we went to, um, I, it was Heidefeld to Tuzela Center first. He sat for so many hours from one hospital to the next. The doctor wasn't there, so they advised us to then go to um, another Tutuzela centre, which we did. When we got there, we were told that we had to wait. And eventually, Daphne was only seen at about 7 o'clock at the end of the day. Eventually, we came, we came back to Cape Town. And I was actually getting very sick. For winter. Actually, I just didn't know why I was getting. I couldn't use my hands. I couldn't use my hands. I was just very weak. And when I went to the hospital, they said, no, it's just, um, I have lack of nutrition in my body. And however, I didn't know that until the Monday that passed that I actually was HIV positive. So my neck was actually high like this, and then it burst. <laughs> I used to go on to the church on the corner of our road, it was a Catholic church. So he would always sit outside the church every night and pray for me. Actually go out for a second chance. So that's when I started strongly believing that no God is alive. Because he, cause he actually gave me a second chance. I could have been there. And in fact that Monday, I went to love that anyway. So there was like about 20 people praying for me at the same time because they know the when they're going to cut me, uh, to actually remove this clay. And then he came back and then the thing just burst. So it was just blood was coming out and there was no love there. Obviously, yes, it leaves a scar, but it's just a reminder of we're not supposed to take life for granted. Thank you, Lord, that tomorrow will be better than today, and the day after will be better than tomorrow. Thank you, Lord, that you are our target. Give us the courage to stay on the narrow path. Protect us, Lord. Thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Who are we to judge? Who are we to judge? We can't judge. We, we, I, I believe that God created each and everyone in, in His image, and who are we to judge? He's the one that judges one day. I really do hope that her story does help others, um, especially parents that cannot accept 
their children and tell them to leave home when they're 12, where are they going to go? I just hope that this documentary helps other people. And I'm not guaranteeing, but I'm just saying that I know out there there are people that experience what I do. So just remember that you're not alone. You may seem you may seem to be alone at your situation now. But after watching this documentary, just remember that you do have a soul survivor sister out there. If life throws you with a yellow bag of lemons, turn around and open the bag and make lemon juice. And if life gives you a storm, remember it won't last forever. It will just be over and you will see the rain. Remember this, like I said inside, the Lord's Spirit, when you're inside a house, you can't see what the walls look like outside. So don't worry about your current condition. Don't worry about your dirty clothes and your this and your that. I know many people that shower three times a day that are filthy. Honestly, I know people that wear nice clothes that are filthy. It's not important that for the Lord. Because everything you are, your flesh, your clothes, one day will perish.